Chapter 1. Why bother with the Bible? All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and 17. Here are seven good reasons not to read the Bible. One, it's extremely old. What can it possibly say about life today? Two, it's hard to read, as in hard to understand, although the small print doesn't help either. Three, it says objectionable things about sexuality and slavery, for example. Four, it describes horrible events, like God sending a flood to judge people and whole nations being destroyed. Five, it has been used to justify terrible things, like apartheid in South Africa and the Crusades in the Middle Ages. Six, life's too short. Reading it doesn't seem to promise much payback. And seven, add your own reason here. Why don't you read the Bible? Given all that, I wouldn't be at all surprised if you have never read the Bible and don't have much clue about what's in it or why it matters. It seems strange and hard to read. And you're wondering, why bother? One compelling reason to read the Bible. I know lots of people who haven't read the Bible for some or all of the reasons above. And I think that's a real shame. For one thing, most of those reasons don't actually stand up. Yes, the Bible is old, but if we're going to ignore everything that's old on principle, it will make for a deeply impoverished experience of life. Yes, parts of the Bible can be hard to understand, but most of it is surprisingly simple, as I hope you'll see by the end of this book. It does say some things which challenge all of our values, but since when was that a reason not to read something? And while some parts of the Bible and the events it describes are pretty shocking, that's because it is dealing with the real brokenness of our world. In this sense, the Bible is no more shocking than our newsfeed, and even though the Bible's teaching has been abused and misused over the years, had its true message been lived out, the world would be a very, very different place. Whatever you think of the Bible, you can't deny that it's had a huge influence on Western culture. Our language and literature bear the stamp of the Bible at almost every turn, and it contains the teaching of, arguably, the single most influential individual who has ever walked on this planet, Jesus of Nazareth. But none of those are the reasons why I think you should make reading the Bible a regular part of your life. I think you should read the Bible because it's unlike any other book you will ever see or handle. When you read the Bible, you read the words of God. An unusual claim. The idea that the Bible is the words of God might sound weird. In one sense, it should sound weird. How can a book be a message from God? Towards the end of the first century, Paul, one of the early leaders of the movement which came to be called Christianity, wrote to a young protégé named Timothy. In his letter, which is included in the Bible today, he says this, All scripture is God-breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Notice that phrase, God breathed. Paul, who was writing in Greek, may have made up this expression to capture precisely what he wanted to say. His point? That the Bible, even though obviously written by ordinary human beings like him, has its origin and authority in God himself. This is God's book, which contains God's words expressed through the personalities and styles of a whole range of human authors. Or to use Paul's shorthand, the Bible is 
God breathed. This statement of Paul's comes pretty near the end of the Bible, but it's a claim that's made repeatedly throughout its pages. The first 75% or so of the Bible tells the story of the Israelites, describing how they started out as one very dysfunctional family and grew into a great nation before eventually becoming overpowered by others. From the very beginning of Israel's story, God's words were right at the heart of their national existence. After they had escaped from slavery in Egypt around three and a half thousand years ago, their leader Moses said that God had acted to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. Over the years, God kept speaking to his people, usually through particular spokespeople such as prophets and kings. The messages were written down and read and re-read as the words of God. This is what we have in our Bibles as the Old Testament. That's why King David, Israel's second monarch, who ruled around 1000 BC, could write these words. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Psalm 19 verses 7 to 11. From the earliest times, God's people knew that God had spoken to them, and when his words were written down by human authors, he continued to speak as they were read. It's no accident that the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119, is all about the fact that we need to listen to and act on God's words to enjoy life with him. In one of its most memorable phrases, the writer calls God's word a lamp for our feet and a light on our path. Psalm 119 verse 105. When Jesus shows up in the first century, one of his central claims is that he picks up where the Old Testament prophets have left off and that he speaks the words of God. This is obviously controversial with the Israelites of his day, yet in one incident recorded in John's Gospel, as people began to react against Jesus, his friend Simon Peter refused to walk away, saying, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. John 6, verse 68. Paul's statement that the Bible is God-breathed then basically summarises what this book says about itself from beginning to end. Yes, it's an actual human book, written by a huge range of people across a vast swathe of time. Their personalities and passions come across on every page, but behind all that stands the God who brought this book together and brings it to life. That's what makes the Bible a book like no other.